All right, uh, let's go to our leading story in this uh, bulletin. The South African government has received uh, plenty of scientific advice uh, since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. So the latest projections presented uh, to the health minister, Dr. Zuelim Kize, paint a grim picture. So modelers say at least uh, 3 million South Africans will be infected uh, by year end and that 40,000 people are expected to lose their lives. Professor Stephen Friedman from the University of Johannesburg says these projections are dependent on human behavior. He joins me now on the line. Very good evening to you, Prof. Thanks indeed for your time. So let's start with how accurate uh, these models are. All right, good evening, Chris Alder. Look, I think the first thing to be said about the models is that <clears throat> your channel broadcast today uh, a seminar in which the modelers took part, and every single modeler uh, who took part admitted that these models are not precise, that they're based on all sorts of assumptions which are being improved all the time. Um, So that is one argument for not taking uh, them as uh, a a really cast in stone prediction of of what's going to happen in this country. But more important, even if they get the models right, uh, a model can never tell you exactly what is going to happen. A model tells you what might happen if people carry on behaving the way they're behaving at the moment. Um, But COVID-19 is not spread automatically. COVID-19 is spread from human being to human being, Mm -hmm. and it's spread if human beings behave in particular ways. So obviously, if human beings change the way they behave, uh, then the virus can't spread. Mm -hmm. So anybody who says there will be definitely 40,000 deaths by November Mm -hmm. uh, is clearly wrong because whether there are 40,000 deaths in November is going to depend on what government does between now and then, uh, what citizens do between now and then, what businesses do between now and then. Um, So you cannot predict certainly uh, what is going to happen if human beings are involved, uh, because the nice thing about human beings is that we can change what we do if we believe that we're being threatened by what we're doing. Um, So all of this may be, if they get the models right, uh, it may be an indication of what might happen if we don't do what we need to do. But if we do need to do what we need to do, uh, there's no reason why we should have large numbers of deaths. So, Prof, uh, the article uh, uh, which I read uh, 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 by you, uh, you basically said a well-crafted model may warn us of the dangers of what might happen, but not what will happen. So looking at those projections, which uh, surely are a bitter pill to swallow, um, how do we then ensure that human behavior, which is at the center of this, does change because you're saying if we're going to avoid what these projections are coming out with simply human behavior needs to change sure well Casalda, i think the first thing that needs to happen and that's my major concern with these models is that we need to challenge both from the politicians and from the scientists such as professor karim who you're interviewing lately later we have to challenge the constant message that a severe epidemic in this country is inevitable. Mm-hmm. Professor Karim has said this several times, uh, and as far as I know, the Minister of Health today is the first politician uh, to say something rather different. Now, it's simply not true that a severe epidemic is inevitable. Mm-hmm. And the reason we know it's not true is that we know there are countries around the world who had a serious problem with COVID-19 and who don't have a severe epidemic. So it can't be true that every country has to have a severe epidemic. Mm. And if we are in a situation where we can avoid a severe epidemic, then we need to have some serious conversations with South Africans Mm. uh, about what it is that we need to do to avoid that. Um, You know, there are debates about this. Uh, Certainly, uh, you know, there are different views, and I think that's inevitable in a democracy. But if we start from the basis that whatever we do, we're going to have a severe epidemic. Uh, then clearly we will have a severe epidemic because if you start off by assuming there's nothing you can do and you do nothing, mm. uh, what we need to do uh, is to have a look with the resources available uh, at what we can do to stem the tide of COVID-19 at the moment, incidentally. 
Uh, if you look at the figures, if you take the Western Cape out of the picture, yeah. we're not doing badly at all. Mm. We're doing badly in the Western Cape, not so well in the Eastern Cape, mm. and pretty well everywhere else. Mm. So the first point, which seems to me to be obvious, is that we must ignore the demands from business to go down to level two where interprovincial travel is possible. Uh, but Prof, do, Prof, do we simply ignore then what these experts and what seemingly science is saying about what could possibly happen in South Africa if certain measures are not put in place? Because surely then do not want to be caught on the back end of the stick in the sense that South Africa would seem to have been caught of God uh, if nothing is done about uh, you know, what could possibly happen if there isn't some sort of containment of this virus. No, no, Chris, that's precisely the point. Yeah. Um, we need to contain the virus. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm arguing the opposite. I don't think we should do nothing. Mm. I think we should do a great deal. My point, rather, is that you can't do what needs to be done if you are constantly told by the scientists and by the people who are making the decisions that whatever we do, we'll have a massive epidemic. Mm. Uh, it is not inevitable that we will have a massive epidemic. Um, so, for example, the point that I made earlier on, you know, right now, we don't have a massive epidemic in eight provinces. Mm. So what we clearly have to do is we have to devote a great deal of energy to the Western Cape mm-hmm. to make sure that what's happening there is controlled. Mm-hmm. And we must make sure that there's no transmission from the Western Cape to the rest of the country. So we need no interprovincial travel mm. unless... And until the infection levels in the Western Cape are down to the levels which the World Health Organization say is safe to allow travel between provinces. Prof, you've also said that governments and other powerful actors can force or help people uh, to change their behavior. How? And I ask this specifically because in a country like ours, where you have uh, some people who are grappling between going out and contracting the virus and feeding their families, they're basically caught between a rock and a hard place. Certainly something that may apply elsewhere in the world may not apply in, in, in a country such as South Africa, where you've got majority of the people who are thinking about what they're going to have on, the, on, on their plate of food on that, uh, just this evening. Yeah, that's true. But my point is that what you have to do about that is you have to make sure that people don't have to make that choice. You know, there's often a very, in my view, a very patronizing view in this country among those of us in the middle class about people who live in townships Mm. and shack settlements. Mm. We very often assume that they're ignorant, Mm. uh, that they don't know how to protect themselves. None of this is true. People Mm. in townships and shack settlements are acutely aware of what's going on. They desperately want to protect themselves, and very often they can't do it for the reasons you've just said. Now, what we need to do is ensure that they can do it. And quite frankly, if that takes uh, double the spending that the the president announced uh, when he announced his package, then we spend double because we're actually not even spending so far uh, what many other countries are spending to tide people over during this virus. Uh, So you don't take the view where we throw up our hands and we say that people in shack settlements uh, live in these conditions where they have to go to work. We make sure that if they're going to be put in danger when they go to work, we give them money to ensure that they don't have to go to work. Mm -hmm. And many other places are doing this around the world. So you change your thinking. You don't say, look, there's only one way in which we can do this thing. You actually listen to people. And I think that's the second point that I want to make. We can get a lot further in this country Mm. if we start treating particularly people in townships and shack settlements who at the end of the day are the majority of South Africans Mm. as partners in this process rather than as people to be controlled. So if you go to people who are painfully, as I say, aware of this thing and say, let us work together to fight this. Let's see what we can do together to protect the spread of the virus. I think that we'd be very pleasantly surprised by how much can be achieved. And in fact, I'll put uh, that question uh, to uh, Professor uh, Karim when we speak to him after 8 o'clock. Prof. Stephen Friedman, thank you very much indeed for joining us here on The Full View. Always great to have you here.